There is a fascinating observation in the Medrash. The Medrash in Parshas Noach, Medrash Rabbah, says that Noach spent a whole year in the ark. Of course, hibernating, protecting, insulating and protecting himself and his immediate family and all the animals and the birds from the raging flood that destroyed civilization and consumed the planet. After a year, he emerges from the ark. The Medrash says, Olam Chodosh Ra. He saw a new world. Noach saw the world before the flood. He saw the world during the flood from the ark. And he comes out, Olam Chodosh Ra. He sees a new world. How do you deal with a new world? It's different ways, but it's not easy. You have to be ready for it. Noach got drunk. One of the reasons may be was too painful. The vacuum, the void, was too profound. How do you deal with coming out of an ark and realizing that you have to start all over again and you're the sole survivor? You, your wife, your children, your three sons and their wives. And you have to start all over again. That's tough. That's not easy. Maybe that's one of the reasons why Noyach took to the Kiddush club, started to drink. But whenever you're confronting a new world, you have to have the tools, the resources, to be able to navigate it with dignity, with fortitude, with resilience, and with wisdom. I know that the comparison is far from complete. Thank God we haven't been through Noah's flood. God made an oath he wouldn't bring a flood. But many of us have been in hibernation for a year. (laughs) You were in your own ark. Yes, I know it was not like Noah's ark between uh, the technologies of the day we were all in touch and connected maybe more than before but nonetheless a certain component of isolation insulation hibernation at least for many of us who i'm speaking to now slowly the doors of the ark are opening up in israel other parts of the world not everywhere we still have a future that's uncertain may we see the end of this pandemic very very speedily But whenever we emerge from that state, from Noah's Ark, we come into a new world, Olam Chadashra. It's not the same. Everybody has been through a lot. We all had the opportunity to become introspective. Many of us have lost loved ones. Many of us have seen loved ones struggling through serious illness and suffering and untold misery. Many of us our own, on our own, experienced and endured a lot of pain. We have seen children, teenagers, youth, who have been stuck at home for many, many months with ramifications and results that we probably do not yet know clearly. But wherever you are, whatever demographic, whatever position, whatever age, however you were affected, every one of us was impacted profoundly consciously and unconsciously. And we emerge, whether we know it or not, into an Olam Chadash, a new world. Just think about last year, same day, same time. One year ago, the days before Pesach. The news was coming in of one funeral after another. Couldn't even have, been, couldn't even have regular funerals. Everybody was shaken up to their core. Nobody knew what hit them, really. Suddenly we realized that as much as we thought we have things under control... We have nothing under control. We thought scientists, doctors, physicians, biologists know a thing or two about medicine and suddenly the futility, the ignorance of those who are supposed to be the experts came to the fore. It made us all very, very humble. Suddenly we're all spending a lot of time at home. I know myself, I used to travel a lot. I haven't traveled in a year. I've been home almost every single Shabbos. Unique unique opportunities, sometimes unique challenges, depends what your marriage is like. If your marriage is a good marriage, being at home was fun. If your marriage was not a good marriage, being at home was difficult. All the escapisms, all the opportunities to run here and run there and enjoy this entertainment and that entertainment were gone. And now we have to really retreat into ourselves, into our hearts, find out a little more about who we are. And all of you know that a lot of things came out A lot of things that were hidden came out in terms of relationships, in terms of family dynamics, in terms of marriages, in terms of your own relationship with yourself. 
Because whenever we don't have that ability to escape and distract ourselves and numb ourselves through various distractions, we have to look in the mirror. And that's why I say this is an Olam Chadash. We're stepping into a new world. May it be a brave new world. And part of this new world and new consciousness I want to address with you. When we discuss the four questions, 2021 version. And I'm going to ask today a fifth question. This fifth question is, Why is this night different than all the other nights of a whole year? That even when I ask four questions, I still don't get an answer to my questions. There is that one question I've always wondered why the Haggadah does not bother to respond to. All nights of a whole, all the nights of the year, we don't dip even once. And tonight, the night of Passover, we dip twice. We dip carpus and salt water and murder and charesis. But friends, did you ever get an answer to this question? I have searched the whole Haggadah from beginning to end, all the way to Chad Gadya and Echad Miyadeya. And those who say Shir Hashirim, I haven't found an answer to this question. The other three questions, we get an answer to them. It takes a long time. I don't know why it has to take so long. But that ultimately, if you stick it out and you remain alert and awake, you'll get an answer. Why do we eat tonight only matzah and no chametz? Well, at some point at the Seder, closer to the end, we lift up the matzah and we say, There's a reason we're eating matzah tonight because of the food that our forefathers, our ancestors ate when they left Egypt. Marr, why is it that all nights we eat vegetables, tonight we eat the bitter herbs? At some point, we get an answer. We eat the marr to recall the bitterness, the pain, the agony our ancestors suffered and endured in Egyptian bondage. We even get somewhat of an answer to the question of why we recline tonight. It's not explicitly stated in the Haggadah, but the Haggadah does state that in every generation, in every generation, one ought to envision himself or herself and reenact, re-experience the exodus. So I can understand why we are reclining. But that last question, why all nights we don't dip even once and tonight we will give a double dip. There will be a double dipper. I don't see any answer in the Haggadah. What is the answer to this question? Did anybody ever ask this question? What is the answer to this question? Why do we dip twice? Friends, I want to take you on a little journey tonight. I'm saying tonight. Here it's afternoon. By you it's morning. But I'm already holding by the night of Pesach. So I'm saying tonight. And you know the piece in the Haggadah, right? So there's various alternatives when Chazal thought you can do the Seder, Rishchidosh Nisan, Erev Pesach in the afternoon. So morning and night come together, especially it says that the night of Pesach had a status of day. In any case. And I'm going to begin with what would seem like a, uh, you know, small grammatical error, but it really becomes the foundation of a very profound discussion. In the Haggadah, we go through our history. The way the Mishnah says it in Psachim, some of you just learned it, Maschel Begnosu Masayim Bishvach. We begin with disgrace and we speak about our progressiveness, our development as individuals and as a people. And over there we quote, from the Haggadah, a verse from Joshua, Yehoshua Perik Chavdala, Joshua 24. And I want to quote this verse for you, which you all repeat, you're all going to recite the night of Pesach. Yehoshua says to the people, God says, you know, your forefathers lived on the other side of the river, on the other side of the Euphrates. Terach, the father of Abraham, the father of Nachar, they were all entrenched in idolatry. Now listen to these words. A direct quote from the Haggadah coming from Yehoshua, Joshua chapter 24. I took your father, Abraham, God says, I took your father from Iraq, from across the river, and I brought him and I led him through the land of Canaan. I increased his descendants and I gave him a gift, Yitzchak. 
I gave Yitzchak two sons, Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau a place to live in, Mount Seir, which he can inherit and settle in. Yaakov and his children descended into Egypt. Do you see, friends, the anomaly here? Do you see something strange in the structure of these verses? Yes. God takes credit for everything. I did everything. I took your father from across the river, from the other side of the river, and I brought him to Canaan. I led him through the land. I gave him a gift, a boy named Yitzchak. God says, I gave Yitzchak two boys, Yaakov and Esau. God continues, I gave Ace of Mount Seir. And then suddenly the whole presentation changes. God says, and Yaakov and his children went down to Egypt. I did not do it anymore. God takes credit for everything besides Yaakov and his children descending into Egypt. It's like, oh, this, nothing to do with me. Don't blame me. I was not involved in this piece of the puzzle. Everything else I was involved in. But this last piece of them going down to Egypt... This they decide to do on their own. Really, what God went on a vacation suddenly? He developed this whole story, this whole, na- this whole narrative he is completely orchestrating and in control of, but this last step of the game, like, oh, they did this on their own. This, my friends, is the clue. And let me change the subject completely. There is a mitzvah that was done the first Pesach in history. And actually, a few years ago, we were sitting at the table, and my daughter raised the question. And it's really a difficult question. You know, in Judaism, we have a special respect for blood. The halach is, the mitzvah is, if you slaughter a chicken, a bird, or a chaya, an, an undomesticated kosher animal, there's a mitzvah of kisui hadam. You have to cover the blood. There's even a special blessing. Why? Even if we are permitted to eat an animal, but there's respect for blood, we're not allowed to eat blood. The, t- the Torah says, Ki nefesh Because blood is the seat of life, it's the seat of vitality, it's the seat of the soul. You cover the blood. There's a certain awe and reverence and respect we have for blood of a human being and blood of an animal. There's an exception. The exception is the first carbon Pesach. Here the Torah says in Parshish Boy, Moses tells the Jewish people in the name of God, I want you to slaughter a goat or a sheep. And then I want you to take a gudas ezev, a hyssop, a group of hyssop, and dip it into the blood in the vessel. And I want you to display this blood on your doorpost. Dye your doorpost with this blood on the mashkov, the roof, the shteya mezuzahs, the two temples. And God says, I'll tell you why. So that I will see where there is a Jewish home. So I could skip over, I can jump over, I can leap over those homes. So when the, the, the plague of the firstborn unfolds, no Jewish home will be affected. And the question is really, God needs blood to be able to identify a Jewish home from a non-Jewish home. And even if God needs some sign, does it have to be blood? Why does it have to be such a bloody sign? We're slaughtering the animal, we're slaughtering the goat or the sheep, and now I have to dip this grass, this hyssop into the blood and put it all, all over my doorpost? It seems a little... I don't know. In Yiddish, the word madna. It, it leaves us a little bit with a sour taste. Why do we have to, you know, paint our doorposts with the blood of this animal that was just slaughtered? What, what is the meaning of this? What is the significance of this? And it's not a small detail in the Pesach holiday. The entire name, Pesach, comes from this moment. Because Pesach means to jump over, to leap over. Because God says, when I will see the blood on your doorpost, when you will make that painting, when you will dye your doorpost with the blood, I will know that this is a home that I have to jump over, and that's the name Pesach, which in Yiddish means to ibish bring and to leap. It's a leap. And I ask you a question. If you had to decide on the name of the holiday, is this the name that you would decide? Do you think this is the most significant part? God jumping over the home? That's the name, Passover, Passover, Pesach. It's a beautiful Hasidic vart from Reb Moshe Leib of Sosiv, the great master of the holy Reb Moshe Leib of Sosiv. It's like a schmack, a warm, warm insight. <laughs> he said the reason the name of Pesach is Pesach is because when, what's this idea, God jumping over homes? Was God was practicing for the marathon? He's going to the Olympics. Was God jumping over a home? It's <laughs> anthropomorphic terms, which seem strange. So Rabbi Shalev Sansever says that the message here is that Hashem, the Rabbi Nishalayim was saying, he says, I'm going to come to a Jewish home, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start dancing. 
I'm going to start, you know, when you dance, you're jumping. I'm going to start jumping and dancing. Da vointayid, da vointayid. Here lives a Jew, here lives a Jew. God is going to be jumping and leaping and dancing from joy and ecstasy. Here lives a Jew. Ah, a Yiddish ishtub, a Yiddish ahem. A Jewish home, a holy home, a sacred home, a beautiful home. A home of peace, a home of love, a home of affection. But friends, if we take note, we can see an extraordinary dramatic pattern developing here. And I want you to tune in and travel with me on this short journey that we take. But for this, we have to go back 232 years. Jacob, Yaakov, and his children, his entire family, settled in Canaan after many years in Mesopotamia, northern Iraq, southern Turkey. They ultimately came back to Canaan and they settled in Hebron. And we all know the story in the opening of Ayeshev, the brothers of Joseph dislike him. It begins with the fact, they could not communicate peacefully with him. There is a breakdown in the family. There is infighting. There is deep disgust, deep animosity, deep hatred. Vayisnu also. And Joseph's dreams don't help. And Yaakov makes for him the special Xonus possum, this beautiful, colorful silk tunic, which of course only increases the jealousy and the animosity as the Torah describes in Genesis in the opening of the portion of Ayeshev. But we know the continuation of the story. One day Jacob sends Joseph to seek the welfare of his brothers. And when they see him coming, they plot to kill him. It's Reuven who suggests that they throw him into a pit, which is exactly what they do. They strip him from this multicolorful tunic that his father has given him as a gift, and they throw Joseph into the pit. And then it's Yehuda who says, what's the point of leaving him in the pit? We can make some money, ma'betza. Let us sell him. They retrieve Joseph from the pit, and they sell him to the merchants who are heading towards Egypt. And that's how Joseph ends up in Egypt, where he is purchased by Potiphar as a slave. The continuation of the story, of course, is well known. He spends time as a slave. He's accused of behaving prom- promiscuously and violating Potiphar's wife. He's cast into a prison cell where he spends many years, 12 years, until ultimately, in an extraordinary turn of events, he is appointed to the prime minister of Egypt and saves the entire region from a devastating famine. Ultimately, 22 years after he has been in Egypt, he is reunited with his father. He reveals himself to his brothers, and he asks his father to relocate himself to Egypt. That is how the Jewish people end up in Egypt, which will ultimately become a story of oppression, exile, and bondage. They would be there for 210 years until the night of liberation. But there is a detail in that story that the Torah makes sure to emphasize, because there lay a major component of the story. And that is, after they sold him into slavery, the brothers convened and they had a question. What are we going to do with our old man? Rashi calls him the Zakid. What are we going to do with Yaakov? What are we going to go home and say, oh, we took your son and instead of killing him, we sold him as a slave? So they decide to cover up the crime. And we know the story. They take Joseph's tunic and the Torah says, by Yishchatu Seir Izim, they slaughter a goat. They dip his tunic into the blood. They send the tunic to Yaakov and they say, Look at this tunic. Is this your child's or not? Yaakov recognizes the bloody tunic and he says, Yes, it's my son's. Taref, Taref, Yosef, Chayra, Chalasu. Yosef was devoured. He was eaten up by a wild beast. Yaakov descends into mourning and grief. Yisabal al bno yamim rabim. He is in mourning for years. All of his children, his sons and his daughters, stand up to comfort him. He refuses to be comforted. He tells his family, I will go down to my grave. I will descend into the abyss. Mourning from my son Joseph, who was devoured by a wild animal. Even his own father, even his own father, weeps for him. Now at this point, what should have happened? Had they not dipped the tunic into blood, what do you think would have happened? Observing the inconsolable state of their poor father Yaakov, observing the depth and the magnitude of his grief, they would have told Yaakov, he's not dead, he's a slave. And Yaakov, who was a man of means, could have descended into Egypt and bought Yosef back for any price. 
that the master would, pl- would, would tell Yaakov. Yaakov would pay and get back Yosef. But he did not do that. Because Yosef is dead. He saw the bloody tunic. He understood that an animal has killed him. It was pointless to search for him. That is really what sealed the lid on the story. Yaakov could not get Yosef back because he did not create a search committee. He did not call the FBI or the CIA. He did not send messengers to go look for Yosef. He could not pay any money. The kid is gone. There's nothing to do, unfortunately, sadly. That detail of the story really clinches it. That's why Yosef remains in Egypt as a slave, as a prisoner. He's there for 22 years until the Jewish family descends into Egypt, which ultimately results in the Egyptian bondage and exile. Friends, it's the night before redemption. It's the night before the exodus. It's the night before emancipation. Tomorrow we're going to be set free. Moses, Moshe, turns to his people and says, My children, we are going to go free tomorrow from Egypt. But there's another question, a more important question. We will leave Egypt. Will Egypt leave us? We will get out of exile, but can we get the exile out of us? We can be geographically free, but emotionally, are we are we a free people? And for this, Moshe says, we have to go back to the beginning. We have to go back 232 years to that moment that caused this all. That moment when they took Joseph's tunic and they dipped it into the blood to cover up any footprint, any fingerprint of what they have done to him, to make believe that he was devoured somewhere in the wilderness, in the forest, in the jungle. We have to go back to that moment because my children, Moses, Mo- Moshe is intimating, if we cannot heal ourselves from that ability, from that potential to kill each other, if we cannot cleanse ourselves from that inner f- infighting, if we cannot reach a place where we can be united, cohesive, integrated, then we have much more to fear than outer enemies. We have much more to fear than oppression that comes from the outside. What we have to fear is our internal makeup that will allow one of us to sell a brother into slavery and then cover up the footprints of those that, of that heinous act. So Moshe now experientially takes the Jewish people back to that moment. Once again, they're commanded to slaughter a goat. Do you remember the brothers? The brothers slaughtered a goat. And once again, the Jewish people... Yeah. Is that a key clue? Yeah. Did you ever hear this before? No, I didn't. That's pretty cool. Please mute yourself. I usually get feedback after the speech. It's so nice to get feedback while I'm talking, running commentary. (laughs) Thank you. The Jewish people now will also slaughter a goat, or they can slaughter a sheep. The carbon Pesach could be either Menachvasim or Menachism. And once again, they will dip something in the blood. But this time they will not dip Joseph's tunic, nor will they send the tunic to their father Yaakov. This time they will do something else. They will take this blood of this goat and they will dye their doorpost with this blood. The blood is going to be used now to identify that this is a Jewish home. This is where a family, a Jewish family lives in a united and loving fashion. This is a home that belongs to the Jewish people This is a home that is part of a united Jewish nation. You know, the Karben Pesach has a unique law that no other sacrifice and offering has. It must be eaten. It has to be eaten as a group, as a unified unit. Every other offering I can eat on my own if I want. I mean, I can bring in other people, but I don't have to. But the Karben Pesach, part of its mitzvah is... You have to eat it with a group. Usually it was done with a family. You ate it with the whole family. If the family was small, they can add extended family or friends. But there was a chabur and people subscribed earlier. This is what's called minui. You had to subscribe. This is my carbon basic. I couldn't just leave. This was the group. And the Torah continues. 
Paint your doorpost with the blood. And you don't leave the door of your home painted with this blood until the morning. In other words, you stay there with the family throughout the night. You have an argument, that's fine. But don't run away from the home. You're having a dispute, you're having a disagreement, that's fine. But don't drift away. Don't run out of the house. Don't separate from your brother. Don't separate from your sister. Don't separate from your mother. Don't separate from your father. Don't separate from your brother-in-law, your sister-in-law, your uncle, your aunt, your nephew, your niece, your friend. Don't drift away. Moshe says, I don't care if we have arguments. We're Jews, of course we argue. We know today in marriage therapy, fascinating research that has been done over the last few decades. They used to think that good marriages are marriages where couples don't argue. And bad marriages are marriages where husbands and wives are always fighting with each other. Today we know that that's not the case. Even the best marriages, 70% of the arguments that couples have had during the first week after their marriage, they still have 50 or 60 years later. So that when you're 97 and she is 95 and you're sitting in Palm Beach or you're sitting in Los Angeles, and you're enjoying a beautiful, beautiful day. You're still arguing about 70% of the things you argue during your Sheva Brachas. For example, does the, door stay, does the window stay open or do we close the window? Lights on or lights off? Where we're going for Pesach, where we're going for Sukkot, what restaurant are we going to, etc. Those are the smaller arguments and there's the larger arguments. What makes a good marriage versus a bad marriage is not if you disagree with each other, my friends. It's how you disagree with each other. In miserable marriages, we disagree and therefore we drift away. The fight stops, you know why? Because we don't talk to each other. We're busy uh, stonewalling each other, ignoring each other. The fight stops. We drift away emotionally. In good marriages, the argument actually continues. That's the Pshat Machlokas Shil Hashem Shemaim, Sofal Iskan. We learn how to argue. You read the Talmud Bavli, you read the Gemara. Thousands of pages. I don't know if there's a single page that is not filled and saturated with arguments between the greatest of the great. Be'i Shammai and Be'i Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Yehudi, Rabbi Shimon, Abaya and Rava, Rav and Shmuel. Rabbi Yosef and Rabbi Nachman, Ravina and Ravashi. The Be'i Yosef writes that we say in the morning one chapter, Zvachim, chapter 7, Ezel, Mekomon, Shal Zvachim, Katri. You know why we chose that chapter? Why do we say that chapter? The only chapter in the whole Mishnah is it doesn't have an argument. The only chapter in the whole Shish is it has no argument. We're not afraid of arguments. I once heard myself from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he said, you know, two Jews meet. I say, Shalom Aleichem, you say Aleichem, Shalom. Why? Why don't you say, Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. Imagine in English, I say, good morning. And you say, morning good. How are you? You are how? What's up? Up what? Seems strange, but in Hebrew, we all do that. Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom, Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. And he said humorously, because when two Jews meet, even before we get into a conversation, we first have to get into a disagreement. So I say to you, Shalom Aleichem, and you say, Nah, stop hacking a chaynik. It's Aleichem Shalom. Once we establish that we disagree with each other, now hopefully we can have a peaceful argument or a peaceful conversation. <laughs> I once heard from the late professor Eli Wiesel, Eliezer Wiesel, Zechron of Levrach, he said, Jews love arguing and fighting, but we give our fighting sophisticated titles. We fight with the world, we gave it a name, we call it sociology, we fight with God, we have another name, it's called theology, we fight with ourselves, and we call it psychology. Moshe says, I don't care if you argue around that table, but stay at the table! Don't leave the table. The breakdown between Joseph and the brothers was when we stop talking to each other, when we stop listening to each other. Shema Yisrael, if you want to be heard, you have to hear. If you want people to listen to you, you have to listen to them. If you want to be respected, show respect to others. We may not, we don't have to agree with each other, but we have to be here for each other. We have to support each other. We have to be able to rely on each other. The Radak, Rabbeinu David Kimchi, says, why is it that our tribes are called Matos? Vayidaber Moshe el Roshe HaMatos, which means sticks. Who calls people sticks? Imagine you start calling your children, you stick, you stick, you stick, almost sounds like Gagoylam. Matos means sticks. The answer, of course, is because they are sticks, branches, that come from the singular tree of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, come the 12 branches known as Shvatim, Shevet means a branch, a scepter. 
But Radak says the word matos is a stick, which is something you can lean on. It gives you support. When you go hiking, or you'll start going hiking after you get out of hibernation, you take that hiking stick. Or when you go skiing, or when you get older and you need a cane to support you, that's a mata. What's the definition of being a Jew? That you are a stick that can support others. That I become a source of assistance, of help, of support. You know that in me you can find support and trust and loyalty and dedication. And I could find that in you, Matos. So Moses tells the Jewish people, don't leave this house till the morning. Now you're going to put the blood and quarantine in that home like to teach that now we're going to re-identify ourselves. We are one unit. We're going to be here for each other. Only that way can we become a people. If we cannot do this, if we cannot cleanse ourselves from the inability to enjoy each other, to appreciate each other, to respect each other, to be here for each other, even if there are disagreements. He says, we could never be redeemed. We will destroy ourselves from within. Svasemma says something extraordinary. He says, take a look at the beginning of Moses' career and you'll appreciate this. The first day, Moshe, Vayigdal Moshe, Moshe grows up, he goes out to his brothers. And what's the first thing he sees? He sees the first recorded act of anti-Semitism. A Jew is being beaten to death. And Moshe doesn't think much. Moshe doesn't create committees. Moshe doesn't create a website. Moshe doesn't create a world summit or conference. He doesn't create a blog. He doesn't start sending out WhatsApps because by the time he finishes, the Jew will be dead. Instead, Following that tradition, the Talmud articulates in Sanhedrin, somebody comes to kill you, kill him first. Moses kills the Egyptian and saves the Jew from death. Done. The Jew is saved. The Torah says. He comes out the second day. What does he see now? He doesn't see an Egyptian beating a Jew. He sees two Jews killing each other. He tells the Jew, why do you beat your fellow? Ooh, what happens now? The Jew responds, who died and made you king? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Who made you the ruler and judge over us, Moshe? This is when Moshe is terrified. He realized there is an informer and he has to run away from the wrath of Pharaoh. Says this Vasemis, exile creates two catastrophic consequences and casualties. The first one is that there are non-Jews who hate Jews, and the second one is that there are Jews who hate Jews. This is the phenomenon known as self-hating, self-loathing. Jews who are embarrassed with themselves, but it's also the phenomenon of Jews who are proud Jews, and nonetheless, in the name of all forms of righteousness and toxicity, and sometimes religiosity and spirituality, we kill each other. We hurt each other. We don't like each other. We loathe each other. We alienate ourselves from each other. We speak to our children against others. We drift away from each other. And the Svasemma says for the first problem, Moses found a solution. He can fight anti-Semitism. The second problem, by Yom HaSheni, Svasemma says he never found a solution. In fact, he had to run away from Egypt. He could not deal with it. He did not know how to deal with it. Now, years later, it's the night before redemption, Moshe turns to the people and says, brothers and sisters, if we cannot extricate this hatred, this jealousy, this animosity, this divisiveness and fragmentation from our hearts, from our midst, <laughs> we're not going anywhere. Look at his words. Why Agudas Ezov? What's Agudas Ezov? I'm quoting Bo, Parshas Bo. Aguda, you remember the word Aguda? Before there was a party called Aguda, Aguda Sistrol, Aguda Camp, Camp Aguda. You know what Aguda is, right? Lulav Tzorich Eged, the Yeosu Chulam Aguda Echos. Aguda is a group, a unit, a bond. Igud is to connect together things that are disconnected, that are disparate. Agudas Ezev. Why Ezev? Ezev is a hyssop. What's the uniqueness? But in the ancient world, the hyssop was used as a detergent. Take a look in Tehillim, Psalms 51. King David says, 
Techatini ve'ezov ve'etar. Techapseni mushelag albin. Cleanse me with the hyssop so I should become pure. Wash me out so I could become whiter than snow. The ancient, the azov in ancient times was used as soap, as shampoo, as a detergent to cleanse the body. Moses is telling the Jewish people, we need to cleanse ourselves. You take that Azov, you bring it together. You take that blood, we need to cleanse what happened 232 years ago. Because that's when our family was so fragmented. That's how we ended up in exile. And that's why in the Haggadah, God takes credit for everything. But then he says, Yaakov and his children descended into Egypt. Don't blame me. It's the infighting that caused it. And now Moses says, if we want to leave Egypt, we have to make sure not only to deal with the symptoms, we got rid of, a fa- we got rid of Pharaoh's oppression, but can we go back to that core of our inner, inner negativity and toxicity towards each other? Ah, my friends, you see why we dip twice tonight? There's two dips. There's the dip in the beginning of the story, and there's the dip at the end of the story. There's the dip in the beginning of Jewish history, which caused Egyptian exile. And there is the dip at the end of the story, which is the catalyst for redemption. We also dip twice. Mad bilin shteipamim. The first dip is in the beginning of the Seder. In fact, it's the first thing we do for the Seder. Because Kiddush, we do every Shabbos in Yom Tif. Washing of the hands, urchatz, is just a preparation for the karpas. Because when you eat the Dover Shetibule Bamashka, you take a vegetable, you dip it in a liquid. Allah is you wash your hands because there's an argument about it. Of course, we do it without a blessing. What's the first thing we do for the Seder? Karpas. We take the karpas and we dip it in salt water. Why salt water? Why not hummus? <laughs> okay, I know the problem with hummus for our Ashkenazim. <laughs> Why salt water? Oh, yeah, yeah, you take a look. And why Karpas? What's this name, Karpas? A weird name. Where else is there Karpas in the Tanakh? You remember? Anybody knows Karpas? Where is there Karpas? You just had it on Purim. Ahasuerus throws this feast, 187 days, and he has this most expensive materials and fabrics there. Chur! Karpas! Utchelis! What's Karpas? Karpas is a very, very fine fabric, whether silk or a very fine, expensive cotton. Rashi quotes Karpas somewhere. You know where? Yaakov weaves for his son Yosef, Oksonas Pasim. What's Oksonas Pasim? Rashi says, clay millis. Very, very fine cotton or silk. Kemoi Karpas. The tunic of Yosef that Yaakov made for him, Rashi compares to the Karpas. We take that Karpas, that expensive fabric representing Yosef's tunic, We do it in the form of a vegetable. We don't need sweaters or shirts. And we dip it in salt water. We don't need blood. But how many tears? How much salt water was spilled? How many tears did Yaakov Avinu and Yosef and Yitzchak and the Jewish people shed because of that first dip in Jewish history when when Yosef's tunic was dipped in blood? How much salt water was shed from that cataclysmic experience? That's the beginning of the Seder. That's the first dip. As we get closer to the continuation, to the end of the Seder, before we're going to eat the festive meal and finish with the halal and the last two cups of wine, there's another dip. We take the marah and we dip it in the sweet charosas, transforming our bitterness into sweetness, taking those very toxic forces, examining them, revisiting them and ultimately metamorphosizing them so that instead of living in a world of murder, in a home of murder, in a nation of murder, we can sweeten our bitterness and allow ourselves and our people in the world to be set free. That's the second Matbilin. It was Rebbe Hanan Wasserman. Rebbe Hanan Wasserman, as you know, was one of the great Lithuanian sages before the war. He was Rosh Hashiva of Oyel Torin Baranovich, the author of the Talmudic text, the Talmudic book, the, Chid, the Sefer on Talmud, Koivet Shiurim. He was murdered by the SS near Kovna in 1941. 
Hashem Yin Kim Damai. Some of you in California remember his son, Rip Simcha Wasserman. In fact, there's the school that he founded, Ur El Khanan, named for his father, Rebel Khanan Wasserman, in Los Angeles. Rebel Khanan writes in a letter something very intense. He himself is reserved. He says, Lula de Mustafina, he is not comfortable writing this. He's just sharing an emotion and he says, I may be wrong, but I just want to share this. He says, I always wondered, how did the blood libel take root in the consciousness of the world? One of the most infamous accusations against the Jewish people, and one of the greatest lies of history, is that the Jews use Christian blood or later Muslim blood for our matzah, Pesach, for our four cups of wine. The Taz in Shulchan Aruch and Elchus Pesach says, don't use red wine for Pesach because of the blood libel. They were accusing Jews of having non-Jewish blood in the four cups of wine, brought also in Shulchan Aruch Harav in the laws of Pesach. Even though the Gemara says to use red wine, better to use red wine, but they wrote to use white wine because of these blood libels. The first blood libel happens in the 12th century, I think 1143 in Norwich, England. And then it develops and it continues and increases decade after decade, century after century with so many, so much deaths and death and suffering. The famous blood libel of Mendel Bayless in 1911 in, in, in Kiev in the Ukraine. Menachem Mendel Bayless, who had the brick factory in Kiev, was accused of murdering a Christian child for two years. Russia, Russia was trembling. Jews couldn't believe that in the 20th century, this is after the Enlightenment, they thought that the dark ages were behind them. Of course, today we know better. And until today, I read that the Syrian foreign minister a few years ago published a book still maintaining the story of the blood libels. Rebel Khanan Wasserman wants to know, you know, you can accuse somebody of lies, but there has to be something there. Epis, something has to be there. He says, there's no court of shalemis, there's no grain of truth for us. Eating blood is a death penalty. It's an isu kares. And Rebel Khanan says... Perhaps it's because of that moment in history when we dipped our brother's tunic into blood and sent it to our father Yaakov and said, And as long as we have not cleansed ourselves and the world from that type of hatred, from that type of toxicity, there is still this toxicity that lives in the world. And we, the miners' canaries of civilization, suffer sometimes the consequences. It was Herb Brooks who said it best. Some of you still remember the miracle on ice, 1980. The Soviets have been winning medal after medal each year in the competition for the hockey games in the Olympics. The Red Army had a special team that was reserved just for the Olympics. They were united, they were professional, they were cohesive, they were integrated. The American team was disheveled and they lost year after year after year. And then it was Herb Brooks who in 1980 performed what is still known as the Miracle on Ice where the Americans defeated the Red Commies, the Communists. How did it happen? And one of the players once sheared how Herb Brooks, their coach, really put them through the ringer night after night for hours and hours they were on those skates practicing their hockey on ice to be able to win the Soviets but Herb Brooks was not satisfied he had a team that was not getting along with each other they were not cohesive they were not integrated they were not united they were amateur and one night he had them practicing for hours and hours and hours and the poor players literally felt that their feet are going to perish in the process. All they wanted was get over those skates and go into a bed or just sit down for a few minutes. But he was relentless until one of the players turned to him and said, Mr. Brooks, how much longer are you going to torture us for? And he said, I will have you practice until the moment when you, all you guys realize that the name on the front of your jerseys is far more significant than your name on the back of the jersey. Of course, each of us has a name on the back of our jersey. I am Y.Y. Jacobson, 
and you are Yankel or Zundel or Shmetal or Chayo or Basio or Sara or Rivka, whatever your name is, and it's not just the name, it's the title, it's the reputation. Individuality is precious. Individuality is sacred. Individuality is important. What you have to contribute to the story of history. Nobody before you or after you will be able to contribute to the story of history, which is why the Talmud says in Sanhedrin 38, every person has to say, for me, the world was created. There is something at stake in your existence that only you could contribute to the past, present, and future. There is the name on the back of the jersey. But as long as we cannot reach that space where we realize that the name on the front of the jersey, the name of the team, must trump, must be so significant, must be so powerful, at least as significant as the name on the back of the jersey, if not more. How can we ever leave the toxicity of narrowness, the toxicity of infighting, the exile that we create from within? We live not in an expansive world, but we live in a world of Mitzrayim, a world of Mitzrayim, of confinements, of smallness. The fact that, I can't, that it's possible that I shouldn't be on speaking terms with my parents, with my siblings, with my previous business partners, with my colleagues, with the guy who used to be my neighbor. The fact that I can't speak to my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law because we had a fight. The politics, the corruption, the alienation. We don't have to agree with each other. But don't drift away from each other. That's the second dip. Once read an incredible story about um, the Rebbe of Zvil. Zvil is a city in the Ukraine. Rebbe Gedalia Moshe Goldman was a Hasidic Rebbe from the city of Zvil. And in the mid-20s, the 1920s, he was arrested on charges of counter-revolutionary activities against the Soviet communists. And he was sent to Stalin's Gulag, to Stalin's labor camp in Siberia for seven years. One day, Rabbi Gedalia Moshe Goldman, the Zvila Rebbe, together with another Jewish inmate who was older than him and more frail. They were both summoned to the makeshift office of the camp. Standing before them was a Nachalnik, an officer, the warden. And he informs both of these Jews that today is their lucky day they've been waiting for for years. They have served their time and now they are free to return home to their families. He hands them some official papers and asks them both to sign. To the officer's astounding surprise, Rabbi Gedalia Moshe Goldman from Zivil is hesitant. You see, it was Shabbos. And he was undecided should he sign or not. On one hand, it's pikuach nefesh. Staying in Siberia was a question of life and death. You're putting your life in danger because this is Siberia. So you have to sign pikuach nefesh. On the other hand, he felt, I'm still young. He felt healthy. I survived seven years. Okay, I think I could survive even if they're going to push off my liberation. And he looks at the officer and he said, I'm so sorry, but I can't sign. It's Shabbos. It's our holy day. God says a Jew is not allowed to write on Shabbos. I can't sign. The officer was enraged at his audacity. He said, how dare you? You're insane. As a result of this, you may rot in this hole for many more years just for refusing to sign on Shabbos. He then turns to the other Jewish inmate, who was secular, and he says, you sign your paper so you can go free. Something extraordinary happened. This Jew, he was secular. Under normal circumstances, he would have signed. But when he just witnessed the unwavering dedication of Mr. Nefesh of the Zvila Rebbe, he couldn't get himself to sign. He simply couldn't bring himself to do this. So he looks at the Nachalnik, he says, can you let me sign tomorrow? I also can't sign today. And then something extraordinary happened. Rabbi Goldman tells the officer, give me the pen, I will sign his papers. I'm young, I'm strong, I'll survive. But he's older, he's weaker. He can't survive another week in the camp. For him, it's a question of life and death. I am commanded to violate the Shabbos to save him. Give me the pen and I will sign for him. The officer was speechless. He never saw such devotion. He never saw such love between two people. He looked at Rabbi Goldman and he said, I will sign for both of you. You are free to go. My dearest, dearest friends, what a year this has been. 
a year of Atem Loi Seitsu Ish Mi Pesach Beise Ad Boiker. We were told by the health authorities and by our own spiritual leaders, don't leave the door of your home. Whatever that meant in every community, whatever that meant for every person relative to your age, relative to your health conditions, relative to your struggles, relative to your unique circumstances. As slowly we emerge from quarantine, again, every community and every city according to the appropriate health guidelines. And we see a new world, Olam Chadash Ra. It's time for us, for you and I, to really, once and for all, make that second dip. That first dip we already have had more than enough. The carpus and the salt water, we all know what that carpus and the salt water tastes like. But today is the time to consolidate and to finalize that second dip, transforming our bitterness, our negativity, our fears, our traumas, our insecurities, our innate sense that I want to run away from you. I can't deal with you. I can't talk to you. I have to separate from you. Those toxic and dangerous forces that alienate people from each other, communities from each other, families from each other. To say enough to this blood, enough to this divisiveness. We want to transform our murder into oneness, into love, into redemption. We want to unravel within ourselves a consciousness of Gula. And what is a consciousness of Gula if not, first and foremost, my confidence, my ability to create space for you in my life, even if there are differences. I saw a t-shirt, I'm very easy to get along with once you learn to worship me. That's an exile mentality where I have to control everything. There's no trust, there's no fluidity. I have to be in control of everything because I don't like myself. Openness, redemptiveness is when I can expand my horizons and my consciousness and I can recognize ultimately that there's a oneness that pervades us all. All of us are a manifestation of divine infinity. All of us are an aspect of the divine light. All of us serve and constitute an indispensable note in the cosmic symphony. And if one note is missing, the entire symphony is flawed. This is a time to come back together. And as communities are coming back together physically, to be able to re-engage with our friends, with former friends, with future friends, in a way of love and respect and unity until that great moment, Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad, when the whole world all of us and the whole cosmos will be one. Thank you very much. And a kosher and a freilich and Pesach to all of you. I love your background. Thank you. We wish we were there. Amen, amen. May we all be there very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Kaisel, the, 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 you have the background of the Kotel. I love it. It looks... I, I even thought that maybe you're actually sitting there. I'm wondering how they got, you got Zoom there. It looks so good. It looks so good. Okay, that's what we do. Shir Hamalot B'Shuv Hashem at Shiva Tzion. Ayinu? Kecholmim. Yosef is Baal HaChalomot. We are dreamers. We dream. We dream, yeah. We dream. to the whole beautiful kehila, from strength to strength with achdut and love and dedication and unity for you in good health, happiness, prosperity and nachas that's Rabbi if Rabbi Muskin allows I'm happy to take questions <laughs> if it's in, if it's question it has to be at least four questions it's basic four questions but you could start with one, yeah. I think you're one of the greatest rabbis. I listen to you every day. Thank you.
I hope you do it when you're on the treadmill, at least, not when you're eating. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great question, and it's not such a it's not it's not such a, it's not a political question actually. It's a halacha question, okay. and it's a very good question. The Talmud says in Tractate Brachas, page fifty-eight, that when we see Haraya Melech, when we see a king from the nations of the world, we should make a blessing. Baruch Atah Shenatan Mikvado LeBasar Vadam. We bless Hashem, who has so to speak given or bestowed some of his glory onto a human being of flesh and blood, recognizing the idea that as Hashem told Moshe, even Paro he showed respect to, because it's the throne of a kid, it's, it's the throne, it's the power of government. A person who was chosen by God, whether we love him or would not love him, to lead a large, a large group of people, there's, a, there's, there's respect for that position. You know, it's called respect for the cheer. Even if I have issues with the person. God told Moshe to show respect to Pharaoh. He told Elijah to show respect to Achav. Now, the question is, can a president elected democratically be called a king? So the halachic authorities debate it extensively. Some say to say the blessing without God's name. But many of the great halachic authorities say just because he's elected democratically doesn't take away from the power, and in fact, the president has great power. So that's basically what's behind it, especially in this case, I felt that even if there are many things I disagree with or I don't like, but there were also some things that this president did that I felt the Jewish people really should be grateful for, especially the canceling of the Iran deal, the moving of the embassy to Jerusalem, the acknowledging of the Golan Heights as part of Israel, and canceling hundreds of million dollars sent every year to the PA directly to support terrorists and their families. And therefore I felt that there's a special duty that we have to be grateful for when good things happen. That's the, back, that's the background of the story. That's it. Okay, Some of my friends were very upset at me. I don't have to tell you that Trump has people who love him and people who loathe him. And some of my friends were very, very upset at me. And I understand them, I understand them. And I said, you know, this is really not a personal issue here. This happens to be with the, 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 the there's a, something called the throne, there's something called the office of the presidency. You know what I mean? Yes, I remember. And, that, yes. and, and uh, so that, that was bad. That's basically the, the story behind it. Well, thank you, Rabbi, for... Thank you so much for straightening me out. I appreciate it. No problem, no problem, anytime. Hatzlochet to everybody, get yom to everybody, and... Love and light to everybody. Mimitsrayim Gayalton, the Bay Savad and Pedison, or Mimitsrayim, Mimitsrayim, Mimitsrayim Gayalton. Somebody asks, unfortunately, many of us don't get it. The arguments among us often result on people choosing to totally disassociate with one another among friends and families. People don't know how to deal with each other constructively and with compassion. It's a sad commentary back then and through the ages until today. It often is, but what I will tell you is, and I think this is very true, as I often say this, in every situation, you and I and us can either be part of the problem or part of the solution. Are there, is there friction and is there fragmentation? Yes. But every single one of us has influence. Don't underestimate it. 
you have influence with your family, with your friends, with your WhatsApp groups, with your email lists, with your community, with your environment in work or at home. Use that and you'll be, you'll be surprised to see how far positive reach can go. As I said this, take a look at the corona. Somebody sneezes in Wuhan and a few months later the whole world is on lockdown. It's not only true about a virus, it's also true about love. When we harbor, when we model, when we embody a life dedicated to connection and unity, it has a tremendous impact. And I'll tell you, feel compassion for those who are not there yet because they're responding to triggers that are deep inside of them. And they're simply miserable themselves. You know, when I point a finger on you, I'm pointing three fingers at myself. So every one of us has a limited amount of mental space. I can't be everywhere at the same time and think about everything at the same time. I would challenge and encourage all of us, utilize your mental space, not to analyze how bad things are, but to see how good they can be. And that will make a huge difference. Next question. It's very nice people ask questions. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. The world as a whole has come a long way from the days of the barbarians, thanks to Jewish ideals and the Jewish people. The rabbi is talking about the ideal, the goal, what we strive for individually and collectively. We are in a reality closer or further is another thing. But we have to know the goal, where to go. That's all true. And furthermore, there's so much you can accomplish. Next question. God says, I had nothing to do with Jews going down to Egypt. Didn't God tell Avram that his descendants would go down, but he'll take them out? Yes, of course, that's true. Of course, God is behind the descent to Egypt as well. God is behind everything. But the point that this verse is making is that there's an element where we have to take responsibility for our relationships with each other. And it's through that subtle, nuanced, grammatical error, if you wish, or rather wrong choice of words, so to speak, that the Haggadah is answering why we dip twice. This is, part of this theme is based on, what's the source? Part of this is based on the Ben Chai. The Ben Chai was the rabbi of Baghdad, Rabbeinu Yosef Chaim. He passed away approximately 1900, 1910. Rabbeinu Yosef Chaim, he wrote a famous book called Ben Chai. He wrote a famous book called Ben Yehoyada on the Gemara, a sefer called Ben Yahu and other works. He was a great rabbi, a sage, a Kabbalist in, in Baghdad, in Iraq, the Ben Yishchai, the famous picture of him as well. A few years ago, they sent out that somebody said that they found a recording of his, and I said it at one of the speeches, but later I did some research, and I see I don't think it was a recording of his. Um, I also once saw somebody says, Karpas is an acronym for Karpas, Kaf Reish Pe Samach, Klal Rishon Pe Sagur, the first principle is you have to know how to sometimes put a zipper on your mouth. You're getting angry, you want to insult, you want to curse, you want to denigrate. Karpas, klal rishon pesagur. Don't run away, don't drift away. That's the other extreme. I'm not going to curse you, I'm never going to talk to you again. Stay engaged, but you have to choose your words carefully because they can be so scathing and hurtful, you may regret them. Klal rishon pesagur. I also saw a wonderful video or share from my friend, my colleague from the Five Towns, Rabbi David Foreman, who also discusses a lot of these topics and, also, and, and pointed out this, the Yaakov Oban of Yardu Mitzrayim, this idea that they did this, so to speak, on their own. Okay, let's see if there's more questions. How do we do this practically? <laughs> How do we create more unity with Jews? Start today. You don't have to... Let's not philosophize. 
Hamaisu Ike, the main thing is action. Reach out to somebody today with words of kindness and love, with a gesture of love and kindness. Maybe a neighbor, maybe a relative, maybe an old friend, maybe a classmate, maybe a senior citizen in your community, maybe somebody in your building, maybe a relative. Just tell them, I'm thinking about you. Is there anything I can do for you? I want to wish you a good Yom Tif. Just do something. I suggested last year before Pesach, and I still think it's a good thing for each of us to do each day before you go to sleep to make sure you did at least one favor to one person. It could be a WhatsApp you sent them, an email, a text, a telephone call, a favor you did, a word, an action. One favor you helped one person physically, financially, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. Then you go to bed. It could be an email. An email lifting up somebody's spirit. This is how we spread love in the world. Okay, my dear friends, it's been a pleasure. I'll just announce the next programs. Tomorrow morning we have a class, 7.30 a.m. Right here on the yeshiva.net. We're going to continue the, the discourse of the Balatanya on Pesach. Monday night, 10 o'clock p.m., we continue the second part of a three-part series on dating. Tomorrow night is going to be for young men, boys, young men who are in the dating age or time. That's Monday evening, 10 o'clock p.m. on Zoom. If you don't get our WhatsApps or emails, you can, you can ask for them on, the, on info at the yeshiva.net so you can get the Zoom number. And that's Monday, 10 o'clock p.m. Tuesday morning, 9.45. The topic is, why are people so anxious at the Seder night and how can we fix it? That's going to be Tuesday morning, 9.45 you can watch it at theyeshiva.net. Wednesday morning, 7.30, we will conclude the discourse on Pesach by the Balatanya on the secret of Matzah. So we have tomorrow morning, 7.30, Monday night, 10 p.m., Tuesday morning, 9.45, Wednesday morning, 7.30, all on theyeshiva.net. Have a beautiful day. Love you all. And have an amazing, meaningful, unifying, and loving holiday filled with Ava, Achva, Shalom, Reyes, good energy, positive energy, and the infinite flow of divine love. You know what I just realized? I quoted the class was based on Joshua 24, right? That we say in the Haggadah. Now it starts off. You know how it starts off, the Perik? Wow, I never realized this before. I was just looking and I realized this. You see, this is talking about when Yeshua was already older. And uh, he felt that his time is, uh, is coming up and he's going to pass away. And he was presenting to the Jewish people words of history and inspiration for them to know how to embrace the future. So chapter 24 begins, Yeshua gathered all of the Jewish tribes to which city? Shechem, the city of Shechem. That's when he called the elders and the leaders and the judges and the officers. And that's when he told them this speech that Yaakov and his children went down to Mitzrayim. And he continues the presentation about the redemption of Egypt and coming into the land of Israel and the different choices that they made. This is all chapter 24 of Yeshua, which actually ends with the death, the death of Yeshua at the age of 110. And of course, his burial and the bones of Yosef were buried in Shechem. And the last verse, which is Elazar, the son of Aaron, also passes away. And that concludes the book of Yeshua. Where was the speech? In Shechem. What happened in Shechem? That's the place where the brothers were shepherding their flock, where Yosef came 
and they sold him into slavery. So he says this in Shechem, right before his death. Just a very interesting footnote. Of course, Shechem is also the place where Dina was abducted and violated by Shechem. And it's also the place where the Malchus Beis David was split. Yeah. Nablus, today they call it Nablus in Arabic.